I am Eric Burton. Um, I've been with Cicero for two years and I have been in the Workday system for about seven and a half years now. Um, I am primarily in the benefits, uh, HCM, reporting, security modules. Um, and then I have Nicole here with me. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Coinsen. I've been with Cicero for a few months now, um, since July. Um, I am I involved in um, supporting all a lot of the HCM elements and um, including benefits. So I'm here to help out Eric as he tells us about some benefit tips and tricks. And as Nicole said, we were going to go over some tips and tricks in the benefits module. Now, we unfortunately can't go over everything in benefits because it's a very large module, but we'll give out some uh, some big tips that are at least ongoing for the current period of the calendar year. And then we'll talk about um, a couple other pieces as well. Okay, so our first section will be open enrollment. Um, as most of you are probably going through right now, um, at least your discovery session for whether you want to do new plans, whether you just want to change rates, or hopefully you don't have any rate changes. Um, but these are just some of the tips that I like to give out to my clients and then also things I think about when I need to configure open enrollment for clients. So one of the biggest things is that Workday just uh, made us a current release um, where they had a new design change. Uh, so it's a, a brand new layout experience for the employees if that hasn't been activated already. Um, what this does is that instead of the whole uh, multiple window uh, feel that they had previously, they put everything in a tile format and it's all on one page. So hopefully you've had a chance to uh, get training on this. Um, you've showcased this to your employees and you've been able to launch that out because unfortunately Workday has made this mandatory for um, everyone's platform. And this is the new layout going forward whenever anyone wants to do a life event change, open enrollment or any um, events for benefits. Another thing um, to think about are, are you just doing great plan changes? Um, where do you do them in the system? Um, so that's definitely one thing that you really need to know is that where in each benefit plan to change the rates. Um, if you have insurance plans and are using rate tables to make sure that all of those are updated, uh, make sure that if you have uh, payroll limits set up and there are limits that are different this year to make sure that payroll is not um, still looking at the 2020 plan year and it's looking at the new plan year. Another one is, are you changing plans? Are you adding new vendors? Uh, that's gonna be a major impact to you configuring open enrollment. Um, so that would require quite a, um, a bit of configuration and making sure that you create the right plan, um, whether that's a healthcare plan, insurance plan, additional benefits plan, either healthcare, FSA, it depends on what type of plan it is as to which section you need to put it into. Um, the next section would be integrations. Are your current integrations still working? That's very uh, necessary right now. You wanna make sure that all of your integrations are working. And then if you're changing a uh, benefit plan or you're changing vendors, um, those could require brand new integrations. Uh, so you definitely want to um, make sure that you get started with those right away because integrations are probably the most uh, labor intensive part of this. And usually, the third party vendors for the integrations, they're a little bit slow to um, respond. Um, typically, uh, most of our integrations consultants here say to give them at least four to five weeks, um, only because there's usually a lack of communication and there's also a lot of back and forth testing. The next piece would be the help text instructions um, and any changes. Uh, most um, instructions do have like dates in there saying, referencing like last year's benefit plans, last year's rates, or maybe different uh, websites. And then this year you need to update those dates, update any of the information that pertains to the new plans, new vendors, or any other, other type of changes that you have in there. And what's great is that Workday's latest release, um, before you could only do instructions for certain areas, whether it was a healthcare, insurance, additional benefits. So you're only limited to updating instructions there. They have now updated their instructions to, you can do it for a medical plan, for a dental plan. So that way you can actually separate out all of your instructions uh, per each little um, icon that they click into. 
And then the final section would be enrollment rules, um, whether you have um, started new type of benefit events um, for your employees and whether you need to update those rules or just to validate that your current uh, rules are working right now. And some of the uh, frequently asked questions that we've received before is, how soon do I need to begin testing or prepping for open enrollment? Typically, I would say at least three to four weeks um, you want to give for configuration purposes. And I only say about that much, even though some configuration can take um, a day or two to actually configure, is that you need payroll to help test, you need um, internal buy-in from your HR folks, you might need new employees to kind of test to make sure that they understand the experience that they're going through. And then you also need to make sure that integrations have enough time to test and so that you're sending the right data to your vendors. The next question, does it make sense to get an impl tenant or a testing tenant for open enrollment? And obviously the answer is yes, uh, because although everyone has a sandbox tenant, it refreshes every week and you can't always um, turn off that that refresh um, so it's best to have another tenant uh, to kind of build test around um, make any changes because the other thing with open enrollment as we all know is that um, not all decisions are made timely uh, so you're going to have a lot of updates that um, pretty much come close to when you need to launch for open enrollment and then another um, frequently asked question is why don't i see complete open enrollment events and that's typically because most people don't realize that once you launch open enrollment, there's a next step um, when your uh, window for enrolling is completed is that you need to go to the open enrollment status report, which is a report, but it's also a task in there. And that allows you to close and finalize open enrollment. And then when you do that, it stops everyone from um, making their own personal elections. It doesn't stop the admins from making corrections after the fact, but it does stop all the enrollment um, period. Uh, and then once that's done, when the effective date, let's say it's 1-1, one, one, so January 1 will be when you'll see all of those benefits impact on the employee profiles. Okay. Next section, so life event tips. Um, now, most people do understand how to handle life events, but there are just some key pieces that, you know what, maybe some tips would help be helpful. Um, one of them is for event management. Um, there are some where you have a lot of events, like you can have birth, you can have adoption, you can have an unfortunate death in the family, um, and then you can just have like a lot of events for them to enroll into. What might be best is to actually streamline those events um, and make sure that the employees only have like maybe three to four to actually click on instead of like a whole list of like 10 or 15, because that can get a little bit, um, uh, can get a little bit cumbersome for them. And sometimes they just kind of like bog down and don't want to even enroll in there. Um, so that's just some things to kind of look forward to. Um, and then who do you want to initiate? Do you want the employees to initiate the events or do you want somebody else to initiate, maybe someone in HR? Um, so that means you probably get like a form from the employee and you'd help them to kind of like run through the loan process. So it really depends on who you want to initiate and how um, you want to streamline the process. Um, another thing are administrative actions. When do you need to actually correct an event? Um, you do need to make sure that it doesn't, uh, the correction isn't done after a payroll period. Um, so let's say today is 10-1 and you're correcting an event from 9-1. Just know that when you correct that event, if there are any um, changes to the amount um, that the employee owes is that there will be retro um, taken to the fact. Or if you don't have retro turned on, make sure that you also update um, what if they owe, if it's additional or if they need to get um, money um, given back. And then managing open events and kind of coordinating them. So some of the things to remember is that events will not auto close themselves unless if you actually run this task called finalizing benefit events. Um, what you can do with that is that you can run it manually whenever you need to, or you can also schedule it. Let's say you want to close out higher events 30 days after it's been initiated. Um, you can set it up for th um, those occurrences, or you can just have it run um, 
let's say every month, um, just to kind of close out anything that's old, or you can just kind of use it to look at what events are open and then you can go into there individually, check out the event, see why it's um, paused, and then you can either cancel it or reach out to the employee and let them know, hey, you still have a benefit event open. Let's make sure that we kind of close this in a timely manner. And then another thing would be um, passive events, uh, typically for company auto enrollments. So you will have like a program like EAP, or you could have a um, parking program or a mobile uh, program where everyone would get into these um, without needing to enroll. What you could do instead of having those part of your active enrollment events is that you can have this as a passive event um, and make sure that they're enrolled into it right away instead of their hire event or their job change event of holding up them getting into these uh, these company benefits. The next section, Affordable Care Act, and this is probably one of the biggest things that people don't have a lot of experience in. And unfortunately, there's not too many things that I can talk about because a lot of these um, configurations are, you need to talk to your legal team on this to make sure that you're configuring everything correctly. But there are at least some pieces about that that I can inform you to kind of look out for when you need to configure ACA um, for your system. Um, one of those is the Affordable Care Reporting Configuration Task. It's a long name, I know, it's unfortunate. Um, but things that you want to look at are the population. Who are the ones that need to be um, reviewed? Um, obviously, it's usually your part-time uh, population that work 20 or under hours or probably under 30 hours, depending on what your um, limits are for being uh, enrolled into benefits. The look back, um, these dates, sorry, look back dates, these pertain to more of the workday uh, standard reports that are in the system. It's not something that um, will ruin any type of calculations that you have going on, um, but these work for reports. So basically you wanna make sure that it's the measurement period um, that you're probably currently going through at the time. Uh, the next would be the hour source, making sure that all of the um, hours are being tracked. Typically it's got um, tracking through the scheduled weekly hours, uh, um, track through payroll, and then there's also tracking through an EIB load. I would say make sure that everything is checked off because you never know if you're going to load in hours, even if um, you've been running it um, with just payroll um, for now. Um, another piece is the payroll hour source. So these are all the pay codes or pay component groups that pertain to the hours, um, paid hours worked and then paid hours not worked. So those would be um, like your overtime, regular double time for paid hours worked, and then um, paid hours not worked would be like bereavement, vacation, um, such like that. So you need to make sure that all the hours that you want to track are in those two categories. Okay. The next section, measurement periods. Um, so usually you can go between three to 12 months for measurement periods. I would say typically your duration period should be 12 months and then have it align with open enrollment. So that way you're not worried about when events are being launched out for those that are newly eligible for, for ACA. Um, so I would definitely recommend the 12 months, but if you do a six month period or even less than that, just making sure that your passive events are set up to pick up those new people um, for those measurement periods. Uh, for eligibility rules, again, this is also kind of similar to what you're doing with the affordable care reporting configuration. So you're making sure that um, it kind of aligns um, with those eligibility rules, who's being tracked. Um, with the measurement period, it's uh, usually a couple months before you would actually launch out open enrollment. So you're making sure that everyone that is eligible um, is also before they would enroll um, for your enrollment period for open enrollment. Um, also uh, creating rules for the safe harbor and the 1095C tuning. Unfortunately, again, I can't really uh, give you examples of that because it does differ per company. Um, but those are just um, some rules to consider also when you're building out your 1094 and 1095 um, C forms. And then passive events. Um, this really does depend on what your configuration is, but generally you have 
um, one passive event to make sure that you're picking up anyone that's newly eligible. And then you could also have another passive event um, if you want to drop people from coverage, if you want to send out different notifications of, hey, you're losing coverage, make sure that um, if you're going to get coverage at a different source to reach out at this time, or if they're newly eligible to let them know to go into the to work day to enroll into their new benefits. And then finally, the end of year 1094, 1095 C forms. Um, Again, another one of those things where it's tough to kind of give examples of, but just making sure that um, when it comes to the setup that you're including um, your population that needs to go into the, the forms and then to make sure that you exclude anyone that needs to be excluded. Typically, these are contractors. Um, you need to set up the contact information um, of who the forms go out to. And this is, if this all follows the same stuff that you would um, need to fill out if you're sending it to the IRS. But the great thing is that Workday can do it in-house and it can either do it where you can print out all of the forms and then you can mail it out to the IRS or you can also set up an integration. And then once you configure everything for that year and then run the reports, um, you can then send it electronically to the IRS. Okay. And then the final section, which is kind of like in my big wheelhouse is reporting. Um, and here are just some common and must have reports, or at least reports that I would suggest running. Um, some of these are custom reports that you would need to build. And then a couple of these are workday standard reports that I found very useful. Um, the first one would be my kind of like benefits data explorer. So it's like an all encompassing report. Um, you dump out all of the fields that would pertain to eligibility rules um, that would pertain to benefit groups. And then this is just kind of like a maybe once a week or once a month um, check that you would do to make sure that all of the new hires, anyone who's going through a job change or an edit position where their eligibility um, or sorry, with the fields that could have changed during these events could impact eligibility rules or um, going in and out of benefit groups. So I typically would run this usually twice a month. Um, and then once you kind of get used to the data, uh, you can go really quickly through the reports. Uh, and this really also does kind of help you understand what's in the system as well. So if you do need to make major changes with eligibility rules or benefit groups in the future, you'd have a very good grasp on um, what pertains to those rules um, and those groups, and then you can make adjustments as needed. The benefit census. Now, this is a Workday Standard report, but the reason why I didn't um, put Workday Standard on here is that a lot of people like to create um, an offshoot of the benefit census because it has very basic information in there. And a lot of people like to pull in a benefit group or a company job profile, um, fields like that. So that's why I kind of made this more of like a custom report uh, so that you can adjust on your own. And then the benefit premium report. This is a workday standard. There is also a way to make this a custom report. Uh, it does take some very labor intensive um, calculated fields, but if anyone does need assistance with that or any of these reports that I'm um, mentioning right now, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I have these uh, templates handy uh, and then we can kind of look at your system and then um, match up these custom reports to what you need. And then I have my email as well as Nicole's email at the bottom if you do have any benefits questions or even reporting questions. Okay. And then the two ACA reports, um, these are very great reports in terms of just auditing purposes. So the first one is just a row by row um, for each employee. It's a one row per employee that'll show the total and average worked um, and non-worked hours so that you can bump that up to the measurement period and making sure that everything is looking correctly. The next one, the hours by pay period is multiple rows for each worker. And then what that'll report out on are the hours that they worked and not worked per pay period. And then you can total it that way if you are kind of questioning um, what Workday has in their, um, in their views uh, on the employee profile. And then these are post enrollment audits. Um, I didn't really list all of them out, but typically uh, these are just tr tracking to make sure that um, 
that those events are completed, that if there's anything in progress, um, and then it's kind of more individualized, whether you want to look at just like an HSA event or you want to look at open enrollment events. So this is more um, custom to what your company needs, but I have seen a lot of uh, clients request different um, post enrollment audits. And then there's your benefit payroll deductions. So this is just making sure that, um, and this is typically when you're changing plans or just you just want to understand if the employee is getting the right um, deductions for each of their enrollment events, uh, sorry, for the benefit plans. So this is basically looking at like an earnings or deductions register, and then you're just pulling each code that you want to look at, and then it'll pull by pay period, or if you want to pull everything from one pay period, um, you can run a, you can create a report that way. So it really depends on what you need um, when you're looking at these audits. And then there's the benefit event status report. So again, this is another standard report, but a lot of companies and clients have asked for customized. So that's again, why this is not a workday standard one. Um, so this is kind of very similar to post enrollment audits, but this is just a more generic um, event status report. And then the last one would be a dependent audit. Um, this is usually very useful when you want to make sure that the dependents that are being tracked in the system are the right dependents. Um, there's a lot of employees that accidentally create um, duplicates of their own dependents. So you, utilizing this audit will let you kind of um, correct any of those duplicates or allow you to make sure that if a dependent is say like 27 and they're still on a benefit plan, we all know that they're supposed to be aging out at 26. What happened in the system to um, give that employee, or sorry, give that dependent um, access to that benefit plan? So these are a lot of the reports that I like to use on my behalf when I'm either auditing a system or just use, usually with like my day-to-day -day, um, looking at benefits, making sure that um, all of them are running smoothly.